So some of you will remember, and some of you are new since then, uh, but a couple of summers ago, uh, especially when it got warm like this, uh, we just kind of spent the whole summer just going, ah, summer, ah, Jesus. We got that moment uh, the, these last couple of days, had a couple more days like that in uh, St. Louis, where we were, just, we just were able to go out on the few breaks that they gave us and that to walk around the hotel and, and uh, just to enjoy some of the uh, warmer uh, weather. So um, over the last, uh, we're, we're in a week seven of this 10-week series of what we're uh, calling uh, Know the Bible Now, and we're in week seven, and for the first six weeks, we were in the Old Testament. And uh, again, as we move into the New Testament this week, it's for me, it's just kind of, ah, the New Testament. Not that Jesus is not in the Old Testament, um, and, and he was, and we've been showing that over the last uh, number of weeks. Uh, but on this uh, Sunday, and for the next uh, few Sundays, we get to go into this New Testament, the wonders of the New Testament, the, 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 how Jesus kind of leaps off of the pages in so many ways, uh, just as he leapt off, leapt off some of the pages in the Old Testament. But again, um, some of you, if you've been uh, tracking with us, let's know your Bible now, and even if you're, you're not, I think maybe you'll gain a couple of things. As I, um, I just want to uh, go over a few of the things that you'll be reading this week in your uh, um, reading guide in week uh, seven. Um, so we'll, we're going to look at a couple of the, they've got some infographics in this book that I think are just uh, amazing. So we're going to be looking at the four Gospels, Ma- Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John this, this week. Kind of Again, this is a whole flyover of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We're kind of more at 30,000 feet than trying to dive in too much into it, but they've got this infographic on page 207. It says this, the Gospels are unique writings that present the words and deeds of Jesus to teach who Jesus is and how he accomplishes our salvation. That's why we're wanting to follow this Jesus. He, he's, and so when you look at the Gospel of Matthew, um, it's got that it's 60% words and 40% deeds. Uh, of Jesus, 60% words of Jesus, 40% of the deeds of Jesus. In Mark, it goes 40% words and 60% deeds. In Luke, it's 50-50, 50% words, 50% deeds. In John, same thing, 50-50, but then it adds this comment. John is unique among the Gospels. John begins by presenting mostly Jesus' deeds and then records Jesus' teaching, his, his words in prayer on the night he is betrayed. These long chapters of John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, all of them on the night before he's going to be. And so John records all these words of Jesus there in the Gospel of uh, John. Um, over on page 211 this week, there's just this little sidebar, the names for our Savior that appear over and over. So Christ, when you hear the word Christ, it actually means anointed one. So sometimes we'll hear Christ Jesus. Sometimes we hear Emmanuel. Especially at Christmas time, when we know that means God with us. That's the name Emmanuel. Jesus referred as Emmanuel. He's God with us. The name Jesus itself means Yahweh is salvation. And then sometimes we, we see Christ Jesus. Sometimes we see Jesus Christ as listed. And then Lord, Savior, Son of David, Son of Man, Son of God, all these titles that are given to Jesus. On page 213, um, it, it's featuring the Gospel of Luke, and it's, it's entitled... Supper with the Lord. There's five meals that Luke features in his gospel. Uh, we know that um, in, Matthew, in Luke chapter 5, Jesus, when he calls Levi, who we know as Matthew, he's the tax collector, Matthew hosts a party at his house, and Jesus has a meal with a lot of other tax collectors, and the religious people don't like it, but there's a meal there. Um, one of those people that probably didn't like that was a Pharisee. And in Luke chapter 7, we hear there's another meal that Jesus gets invited to. And as he's at this meal, the party kind of gets interrupted. And it's very, very uncomfortable as this woman with a reputation comes and starts crying. And her tears are falling on Jesus' feet. And she's taking her hair and wiping his feet with her hair. And, and, but it's a meal there. And Jesus is present. We, we know in Luke chapter 14, Jesus talks about this, these parables uh, about a feast and a banquet. We're all headed towards a heavenly feast, a heavenly 
banquet. There's going to be a meal in heaven coming our way. The meal that we just celebrated and remembered Jesus' body and blood by, his, his death and his resurrection, his life by, uh, the, the Lord's Supper happens around a meal. Then we know there's one more meal that Luke features after Jesus is risen, when he walks from Jerusalem to this little village at Emmaus, he sits down at a table, and when he breaks the bread, they finally see that it's Jesus, and we know he disappears, but there's a meal that's set there. And um, one, one more uh, that I'll share that you'll be reading this week, if you're reading along, I think there might be a few more of these books available if you're interested at all. And uh, again, we've got over 100 of them out there, so hope that you're uh, tracking around. And on page 228, as it's featuring the Gospel of John, it does this tent thing, and it's got all these I am statements as kind of the, the, the pillars, the, the post of the tent, and then it talks over the tent uh, uh, that, that there's this intro to, to Jesus' ministry in chapter 1, then all these signs of uh, Jesus in the next number of chapters, the Passover and the Passion, and then uh, finally the conclusion in, in John 21, but there's all these, you know, uh, pillars that are, and it's all these I am statements where Jesus says, I am the, I am the, the, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the, the light. We're going to look at that one in, uh, after when we get to the end of our message today. So again, lots of a uh, wonderful thing in, uh, in this, uh, our reading this week, and as we're in the New Testament, it's just like, again, just, ah, Jesus, to just walk with you, to be able to follow you. So what I want to do in the time that I have remaining today is just we're going to take a few passages from uh, each of the four Gospels and kind of tie this uh, in, uh, to, to, together today. So when Jesus starts his ministry, Matthew records um, that uh, he's in a certain location. He's going from one location to another location. Oh, over the last number of months, if you've been with us or if you're just coming in now, we've been talking about this idea that there's stops and steps. You know, we stop to, to read, but then we step to follow. Uh, Jesus does these stops and these steps, and that's kind of the pattern of his ministry. It's kind of the pattern of his life. So uh, Matthew wants us to kind of pay attention to this overarching pattern that Jesus is going to do throughout his whole ministry as he starts. So in Matthew chapter 4, it's kind of early on in, as he begins his ministry where it says, Leaving Nazareth, so that's where he grew up, leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, this little uh, village not, not far from... the uh, the Sea of Galilee, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. These are a couple of terms from the Old Testament tribes of Israel, this region of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. So Matthew is reaching back six, seven hundred years to the prophet Isaiah who could somehow see what some of the things that Jesus would do even those many years ago. And so he quotes from that prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, so it's existing back then, it's existing today, the way to the sea along the Jordan, talking about the, the, the river, the Galilee of the Gentiles, so Jesus is not just for the Jewish people, he's also for the Gentiles. And it says, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. Again, Jesus is this light. We're going to see that. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, Again, this light is dawn. The sun has come up. There's a warm wonder to who this Jesus is. And then it, Matthew gives us this summary. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. When Jesus would step out of Capernaum and go to another village, as we're going to see in a moment, he would talk about repent for the kingdom of God is near. When he would uh, step out of another village and go step in, uh, stop at another village, he would uh, step with repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. So there's this pattern that he's establishing over and over, no matter where he goes. No matter where the church of God is now, it's still going towards us. We need to repent for the kingdom of God is near. We didn't know that the life that we're living right now is not going to be the life that we're always going to be able to live. We're going to live to the best that we can now, but we're going to be following this Jesus, following this Jesus, following this Jesus. So a few chapters later in Matthew chapter 9, we read this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages. He's going through all kinds of towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. So again, he's, this, this is nothing new. He's been following this pattern. And healing every disease and sickness. And then when he saw the crowds, he had, what's the word? Compassion. Compassion. 
There is a compassionate warmth that Jesus has for souls that matter to God. And it says, why is he having this warm compassion on them? Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But there in verse 26, just for a moment, the harassed and helpless. Part of the reason that all of us are here this morning, we've experienced some of that. There are times in this world that we just kind of feel harassed and helpless. Again, uh, there's a lot of that kind of spirit in our country these days because of this political election year. You know, we're not in control of who's going to get elected. We hear all the news, you know, you hear this side, you hear this side, this candidate is goofy, this candidate is even more goofy, this candidate is going to be the goofiest of all. Then we're just kind of harassed and helpless. There's things that happen that sometimes, you know, we're just, just, we're harassed. Jesus comes and he has compassion on us. And the invitation is always, follow Jesus. I can pay attention to the election, but follow Jesus. Pay attention to the economy, but follow Jesus. Pay attention and give your best efforts at the job that God has you in, but follow Jesus. Pay attention and love your children well, but follow Jesus and model for them how they might follow Jesus. But we'll be harassed and helpless no matter where it is that God has us. But to follow Jesus, there's hope of compassion there. I want to reach back, actually, into the Old Testament for this verse that we always are um, referring to. And the reason that we're referring to this verse over and over again, because it's a verse that is what I call a Bible thread. This verse is true before the Bible even comes into existence. It's true before Genesis has its first word. It's true all the way through the Bible. And then it's true after the Bible ends in Revelation. This verse is always true. And so it should come as no surprise that when Jesus comes on the scene, he fulfills, he embodies this verse. We know it's this verse spoken in Exodus chapter 34. And God is passing in front of Moses. He's up on the mountain a second time to get a second set of the Ten Commandments. Because as you know, many, many of you know, that Moses was up on the mountain, had got the Ten Command- Commandments and two tablets of stone, went down. The Israelites are being wild people. They're, they're being harassed and helpless. Like they're, and then they're harassing and, and uh, preying on other helpless people. A lot of the, probably the, the, the women in that. And he throws them down and there's stuff that happens. But now God calls them back up. But God speaks these words to him. When you think about me, when you go back down this time, tell the people this. When they think about me, I want them to know that I am the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And it's a Bible thread. Those words will be repeated in many other Bible books, places in the Psalms, Nehemiah, Jonah, other places. And then Jesus comes on the scene in this book of Matthew. It says when he looks out at people like us and sees that we're harassed and helpless, well, he has compassion on us. It wasn't compassion just during the time of the Exodus. It wasn't compassion just during the time of Jesus being on this earth. That compassion is still with us. That compassion is for us. So this last week, we were at this Stevens Ministry Leadership uh, Training, and uh, again, I was uh, telling you a little bit. So there's this, uh, we met this lady that sat at our table, and we just immediately kind of adopted her. A wonderful uh, um, uh, lady that's probably a few years older than me, and I'm old, and so she's just a few years older than me, uh, but she's been serving as a Stevens Ministry for uh, 15 years. She's from Storm Lake, Iowa, uh, and she's, she actually is a member of a Presbyterian church, but she does Stevens Ministry under a Lutheran church, which I was like, oh, that's awesome. That's very, very cool. And so, uh, again, she just kind of brought a warmth and a heart to all the kind of systems. And here's this leader that's supposed to do this and this leader and this leader and this leader. It's kind of all these kind of things. I'm just, uh, you know, go to the go to file folder S through B. Go to file folder folder S8. 
8 or S8A, go to file folder T1 or T25, and I'm just going, oh my I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And then this lady comes and uh, she's, she's done what, there's 50 hours of training, which seems really, really daunting, and it probably is, but she went through it and said that it's helped her in so many ways as she's met with person after person over the last 15 years and walked with them when they're harassed and helpless. Harassed and helpless with cancer. Harassed and helpless through a divorce. Harassed and helpless through a death. Harassed and helpless through maybe losing a job. Harassed and helpless when the last child leaves for college or leaves for life and you all of a sudden are an empty nest and you are looking forward to it, but yet there's... So the whole premise of the Stevens ministry is that we are all can be harassed and helpless at different times. And what would it look like? What would it look like if someone would just walk with us for a little while? And some of the weight, some of the harassed and helplessness that we're feeling, we could just share a little bit of that with another person. Not to fix us. Not to spout off wisdom. At times, not even to spot off Bible verses that would fix us, but maybe some Bible verses that would just help us to know we don't have to walk alone, that we could walk together for a little bit. And we would be lifted, and Stephen Minister would be lifted, and God's church would be lifted as we follow, because harassment and helplessness just keeps coming at us. What would it look like? So when you go to the, our, one of our driving values, this is how I did that. Behind every set of eyes I look into, there is a soul that matters to God. There's a soul that matters to God. There's a soul that matters. Every one of us in this room has a soul that matters to God. And our souls get harassed and we feel helpless, but our souls matter to God. How do we bring some warmth to those, to our souls? Again, in the Gospel of Mark, there's this amazing Bible verse. It's kind of a haunting Bible verse, but yet, I think it's haunting in a very, very good way. Jesus asked this question, and I think the more that we can embrace this question, the more that this question can even embrace us. Jesus says, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Again, the Bible verse is talking to each one of us. Because each one of us has a world that we live in, our world. We're not talking about the world of some high-powered politician or someone who is very, very wealthy or someone who is a CEO. We're not talking about uh, the world of someone who is now a refugee. We're not talking about a, a, a world of someone that is different from us. We're talking about our world. And sometimes our world can be consumed by our world. And we want to be people that have a nice home, maybe some great furniture and some warm decorations, warm colors. We want to eat good food. We want to have good relationships with our family, with our friends. We want to do maybe whatever job it is that we're being called to to do it well. We, we, we dream of that one day that maybe we can retire and live comfortably. We, we, sometimes our world is consumed by going to a lot of doctor visits and then f- trying to keep our health going. And, and so our, our, our world, our world, we can kind of gain the whole world. Our world, it's a small world, but it's our whole world. And along the way, we force our souls. Because we don't live in a world that teaches us to take care of our souls. I mean, when you go to a doctor, you're going to a doctor so that, you know, you can get something fixed, like a finger. When you go to a dentist, you want them to work in your teeth and not start talking about your soul. Maybe you'll have that. I don't know. But we go to these people that, you know, in the whole aspect of the, the political thing, it's not talking about how to care for your soul. They're, they're not thinking about eternity. They're trying to get elected for the next four years. So our whole world sometimes can be consumed and there's no thought of our souls until, and you know this, 
our whole worlds are our small worlds. And however we're living in our world, however we've been living in our world, whether it's for a long, long time or a very short time, we are not in control of this world. All of our worlds come to an end. Then what about our souls? So Jesus has this question, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, again, this is one of these verses that just, it, it needs to grip you. It, it, we need to grip it. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we're following this Jesus. As we sang a little earlier, we will follow you, Jesus. How you serve, we'll serve. Where you go, we'll go. Jesus, we want to follow you. Uh, Jesus, we have to realize that we are served, all of us in this room are served by this Jesus. But not just so that we can have it all for ourselves, but we could serve others. We are served to serve. We're following this Jesus. Or in Luke chapter 19, going to, to the Gospel of Luke, uh, again, this is uh, these, uh, one of these Bible verses. This can, it just needs to grip us. And we need to uh, keep this verse in front of us. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. You know when you lose something. If a child is lost in the cold of a Wisconsin winter, whew, we know we don't have long to find that child. Or if a child is lost on one of the hottest days of the world, of the, of the year, we know we don't have long to get that child. We, we've heard the stories every once in a while of a child being left in a car on a hot day. Sin is like that. Sometimes it can freeze us. Sometimes it can boil us. Jesus came to seek and to save what was lost so that we would be warm. Our souls would be warmly bound. So again, this whole idea of Stephen's ministry warm is how do we follow Jesus? How do we follow Jesus together? How do we walk with others that are harassed and helpless? And it's not just, you know, for us to become a Stephen minister so that we can kind of shine up our, our, our badge or polish our apple and say, aren't we good people? It's just maybe our harassed and helpless souls can be a little bit harassed and helpless as we're helping another and they're helping us. And again, we just walk together. I want to finish the time, oh, I'm past time, I'm sorry, um, but, uh, or I'm not past time yet, but we've got a song to sing. Uh, so I'm going to read through John chapter 8, and uh, it's one of these stories that um, continues to grip me, and I hope that it will grip you as we teach it today. At dawn, so again, John puts that in there purposely, it's still the cool of the day, but boy, is it going to get hot real quick. Uh, at, the, uh, at dawn, he appeared, and not temperature-wise, with the weather. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. And they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Can you feel the mob mentality here? They are hot. They, they they're no, don't care about this woman. They don't care about her soul. They're after Jesus. And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And they did not expect that. And all of a sudden, the hot temperature came down a couple of degrees. When they kept on questioning him, Jesus straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And they did not expect that. And a couple of temperatures came down again. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and at this, again, you just kind of can feel the temperature keeping going down from those hot-blooded, angry, wrong-headed men. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until Jesus, only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. This woman almost frozen in her shame. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Somehow she got out, no one, sir. And then Jesus declared, then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. And you just feel the warmth. And then the very next verse that John records for us, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am. It's one of those I am statements that John highlights. I am the light of the world. And it's a warm light, a compassionate light. 
a light for all who are harassed and helpless. Whoever follows me will never walk in the cold of darkness, but will have the light of life. Because behind every set of eyes I look into, there is a soul that matters to God, and God wants that soul to be warm. He wants your soul to be warm. He knows that sometimes your soul is harassed and helpless, and you don't have to be harassed and helpless alone. There are others who are walk with you. That's what the church is about. Again, one of the things that we're always trying to say and help us to warm up all of our souls is that we are God's chosen, holy, and dearly loved. And we know that because of Exodus 34, verse 6. God is the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. So again, it's real early on in this whole system of Stephen's ministry, but you'll be hearing more. We'll be following up. Eventually, we'll invite some of you to commit, and it will be a huge commitment for 50 hours of training, then for maybe an hour a week after that, if you get assigned a person that you can give some caregiving to, uh, caregiving to a care receiver, as they call it, and again, just follow Jesus in serving others. So next Sunday is Compassion Sunday. Again, one of my favorite Sundays of the year because we're trying to help a little child stuck in the grind of poverty know they have a soul that matters to God. And even though they're harassed and helpless, there's some way far, someone far, far away, at times maybe a single woman, a single man, maybe a teenager, maybe a mom and dad and a few children that provide $38 every month. And every once in a while, they write a letter that's warm and encouraging for a soul that is harassed and oftentimes feel helpless. And story after story of these children that are sponsored year after year after year, where their souls grow to be magnificent souls, serving others in the name of Jesus, of how they were served. And that's what we're about as a church. Knowing this God, who is the Lord of the Lord, compassionate and gracious and never changes. Always slow to anger. Bounding in love and faithfulness. We stand with me. Let's pray. We'll sing one more song. And we'll follow Jesus into our week. So Jesus, the wonder of your grace, the wonder of your word, thank you for the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Thank you for the treasures that are in there over and over again. The treasures that we have uh, uncovered and uh, have placed in our hands today, that you've placed in our hearts today, you've placed in our minds today, knowing that those treasures are going to be there again and again and again. So Jesus, you know that we are harassed and helpless often, but knowing you, following you, the warmth and the compassion that you give to us, help us to receive it. Help us to share it. We ask and pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen.